Philippians 3. Philippians 3. All right, so we're doing verse by verse again. All right, so remember this is that as we go through verse by verse, you have to pay attention to uh, every single word on how I explain it. Because there are people who say the Bible is too hard to understand, but what you're going to come to find out is once you get the common sense gist of word for word through this verse by verse Bible study, you'll find out that the Bible is much more easy to understand than you think. The reason why it's difficult to understand for people is because they're baby Christians. They're not used to the words of God, how it flows, how the grammar, the structure, the syntax, and everything flows. But once you're used to God's language, so to speak, you're going to find out real quickly how easy it is to understand. So as I explain every word, don't fall asleep, but interpret it in your mind too. All right, as I explain the verse, because you want to make sure that uh, I'm teaching the truth anyway. For all you know, I could be lying to you, right? That's another uh, line I would like to keep saying is that, for all you know, I could be lying to you. So look at that book. Amen. All right, let's look at Philippians chapter 3. Uh, Fresh Review, verse 17. I taught you before that Paul instructed the church at Philippi that they are to find people to follow. So it is important that we find our own team. That's the importance in everyday life. You find your own friends. So I'm not for in uh, this saying about people who say, well, I'm not in anybody camp but Jesus Christ. So I understand that we're not supposed to follow men. But there's a, uh, the negative side to that is then the person automatically assumes that I follow Jesus Christ, so then because I teach this, I pastor this way, and I follow Jesus, you all should follow. Uh, so then what I teach and say to you is what Jesus would want. I don't like that idea. Men should be accountable to other men. Preachers should be accountable to other preachers. That's why it's good that we find people to follow. Why? It's a matter of checks and balances, right? Because if everyone uh, arrogantly say, I follow Jesus Christ, and, and they all differ, then you think Jesus is all for like teaching and all these kind of things where it contradicts each other. I don't like that. So then uh, it's important that you find your own team. That way there's no rebellious spirit, no pride, no arrogance or false humility. Some people act all humble like, you know, I only follow Jesus. And some people go, oh, he's such a great guy. He's such a Bible believer. No, you don't fool me. You don't fool me. You pick on other Bible-believing preachers without naming them because you're a coward because you're afraid to lose your friends who like these Bible-believing preachers. So I, I have zero respect for that. Uh, me, I'm plain as day. If I don't like anybody, I'm going to call it out. All right, I name people. They say don't name names. No, I name names. That way you know what crowd I follow. All right, so that way it's plain as day. I don't have to act all secretive and then you listen to 50 other YouTube preachers and then go around through 50 different churches and think that we're all in the same bunch together. So it's important to find your own team. And mark those that are wrong in verse 17, right? So you have to mark those who are not in your team, not in your ball field. You've got to mark those who are teaching wrong doctrine. So we're continuing now on that part on verse 18. Verse 18, for many walk... Because remember, Paul was talking about the Christian race, the walk, in, from the entire context of Philippians 3. Remember that? All right, so in the Christian walk and Christian race, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. So Paul says that many are taking their walk, the Christian walk in verse 18, where Paul has told them often, so this is an often thing. And now tell you even weeping. So Paul's telling them even now, crying, he's brokenhearted, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. That there are people who take the Christian walk as an enemy, as an enemy of Jesus Christ. Now, people don't understand that is, well, pastor, why can't you just teach? Why do you have to make an enemy of everybody? Be uh, well, Paul says, I tell you often. Right. Didn't he say that? So, the reason why the church here falls apart and is in apostasy is because there are enemies of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are very antagonistic. They 
uh, reject the cross of Jesus Christ. They don't want to have anything to do with it. They refuse to be counted in line with the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul says that he weeps for these people who are enemies of the cross of Christ. And we can see three different categories here who they are. So the first one, which Paul may have had in mind, are Jews. Jews. Because of the context of Galatians 6. Go to Galatians chapter 6. And then Romans 11. We're going to look at Galatians chapter 6. And then I want you to turn to Romans chapter 11. Notice that Paul says here that the Jews who are of the circumcision, they are against the cross of Jesus Christ because they pronounce a system of works. So then the enemies here, they're all about works. Now, Philippians 3 proves by context, Paul considers uh, he was concentrating on wrong doctrine here about the works, right? Remember he described his Judaism background? At verse 7, 8, and 9. So he counted that all but dung. And then he rejected that. So by context here, he's talking about the Jewish system and salvation by works. He says that because the Jews practice that, that they automatically become enemies of the cross of Christ. Why? Because over here, there is no works. It is clearly by grace through faith. There are no works it involves. It's truly faith. Now, let's look at Galatians chapter 6, and then Romans 11. Look at these two passages, how Paul explains it. He explains that verse 12, verse 12, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be what? Circumcised. So notice right here that the uh, Jews, it's talking about the Jewish religion here. They want them to follow their work system in the flesh. Only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Now notice that. See, they become enemies of the cross of Christ, these Jews. Now keep your hand at Galatians 6 because we're going to go back there. Go to Romans 11. Romans 11. Romans 11, verse 28. Verse 28. Now remember, Paul says he's weeping, right? About the Jews because he has a heart for the Jews. He doesn't want them to become enemies of the cross of Christ. That's why he says at Romans chapter 11, and then we'll look at verse 28, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies. That's referring to the Jews, because the context is verse 26, right? Jews are the enemies of the gospel, but as touching the election, they are what? Beloved for the Father's sake. So notice that they're beloved enemies. Beloved enemies. So, Paul recognizes them as enemies, but he has a heart for them. Now, that should be very important for Bible-believing Christians, yeah. is that, look, um, we do get angry, righteous indignation, right. right? And then we criticize, because if you look at Matthew chapter 23, is the greatest example of Jesus Christ being sarcastic with the religious leaders, yeah. and then having righteous indignation. He even beat people with a whip, okay? <laughs> But, if you look at the ending of Matthew 23, after Jesus Christ, like, chewed them out, he had a compassionate heart. He was weeping for Jerusalem. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how would I have gathered you together? Now, people online, they might see yours truly as being mean when I cut down these wicked Calvinists over here. And uh, not just Calvinists, but a lot of false preachers online. But you have to understand this, that's a lot of sarcasm, righteous indignation in Matthew 23. But also at the same time, it doesn't mean that I leave it like that and I want them deceived and I want some of them, if they are lost, if they're lost, I'll take it for granted that they're saved, but if they're lost, I don't want them to burn in hell. I have a heart. Right. Do, do you think I would want uh, John MacArthur and uh, John Piper and all these Calvinists, do you think that I would want them to die and for them to burn in hell or for them to repent? repent. Yeah, repent. So that's very important. You have to check your heart. A lot of times when you check your heart, when you have righteous indignation, how you can tell is, would you prefer them to repent or would you prefer them to be damned? Then you can tell. That's a good measuring stick for righteous indignation. Now, the bunch of Calvinist trolls, and a lot of them are trolls, so I could care less. I'm just used to the persecution for the cross of Christ. 
Aha. So you, got, you, so you can get angry at me for being all pious. I don't care if you call me pious. If God sees my heart, I care what God thinks about my heart, not you guys. I could care less about you guys. Yeah, so whatever you Calvinist trolls say about me online with my prayer, sometimes I give a prayer at the ending, right? For the enemies or for the preachers that I kick. And some of them will say, look at his prayer at the ending. It just shows what kind of a guy he is. False piety and, you know, false humility. And I could care less what you guys think. God knows my heart. Amen. It's to those people who can see God working in me. If they see my piety, they see my genuine humility, and then my righteous indignation, I care about those people. I could care less about the scoffers. I could care less about the scoffers. God called me to preach, and it's normal to receive persecution. All right, let's go to Philippians chapter 3. I could care less. Now, the first enemies we see here that Paul was looking at are the Jews, okay? So then the first case of the enemies of the cross of Christ are Jews. Now, we're going to go through a list here of the enemies. One, Jews. Let me know when I'm cut off. Second is uh, the worldly people, okay? Now, go to Galatians 6 again. Galatians 6. Who are the enemies of the cross of Christ? Those who are worldly. Okay, so who's the enemy of the cross of Christ? Joel Osteen. Yeah, amen. Yeah, amen. Yeah, there better be amen. Some people froze to death. Oh my goodness, really? Yeah. It's Joel Osteen. You know who's the enemy of the cross of Christ? Who's part of the world? Hillsong. Yeah, amen. Hillsong. Uh, who's the enemy of the cross of Christ as a part of the world? Uh, Rick Warren. Yeah, amen. amen. So why is that? The reason why is because they combine with the world. Yeah. See, so then they put the worldly music, the worldly dressing, the worldly gimmicks in the churches. Why? So then that's how they build up their membership. But that's the reason why they don't get a lot of genuine Christians. That's the reason why. And a lot of them mess up in college once they go to college and become atheists. Yeah. Pew Research Center showed shocking statistics about so many so-called Christians who became atheists. A lot of them, you doubt their salvation. Why? Because of the churches hoarding them up like flies through what? Through the world, not through the gospel, not through the Bible. If they came in for the world, uh, if the church has something worldly and the people came for the world, guess what? They're all going to have is a worldly spirit, not a biblical spirit. And with just a worldly spirit, they're going to keep seeking after worldly stuff. That's why it's so important. Look at Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. And then we'll read verse 14. So remember, the, the enemies of the cross of Christ are verse 12, right? The Jewish people. But then verse 14, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. The cross of Christ is the world is considered dead to you. Look at Philippians 3. Context again. Philippians chapter 3. Look at the context again of the very next verse. Who is the enemy of the cross of Christ at verse 18? Who's the enemy? Verse 19. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind what? Earthly things. See that? So the enemies of the cross of Christ are those who are considered worldly as well. All right, the third one here. Uh, well, before we go to the third one, go to Matthew 10. Matthew 10. Matthew chapter 10. Now, I want to tell you something, Christians, that this can even include Bible believing Christians. You can be saved, you can go to heaven. But you can be an enemy concerning about the cross. That's, good. That's something you have to think in your mind. You may not be an enemy concerning about child of God. Like Romans 5 would say, even when we were enemies in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. So you, you may not be an enemy of Jesus Christ, but you can be an enemy of His cross. Wow. You can be an enemy of His cross. You might say, why? Because you refuse to crucify the world. You refuse to take up your cross for Jesus Christ. So are you an enemy? Are you an enemy of the cross? Or are you carrying your cross? Look at uh, Matthew chapter 10. Notice in verse 38, Jesus says this, And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not what? Worthy of me. Jesus Christ says, you're not worthy of me. 
Uh, that was actually uh, my life verse at the back of uh, my Bible cover here. Obviously, onliners can't see that, but I put a verse there at the back of my Bible. Why? No turning back. When I carry my cross, uh, I'm not going to, uh, if I give up, then I'm not worthy. So, you know, as a Bible believing pastor, it's sure easy to turn back, but uh, that's why that became my life verse is that uh, if I'm going to be worthy for the Lord and be used as a minister, then no turning back. No turning back. Alright, so... But anyway, that's one of my life verses. I don't know if uh, that might be helpful to you in the future, but that's verse 18. That's the second enemy. We see that. The third enemy, believe it or not, believe it or not, so John MacArthur, Kirk Cameron, and even Ray Comfort, they're going to agree with... Uh, Number two here. Number two, they're going to agree that uh, they're going to quote this verse that you have to pick up your cross as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you're not worthy of him and you're an enemy. So they're going to agree with us on this one. But they go as so far as to say, which is distinguished from me, I told you before that you can still be a saved Christian. You can still be saved going to heaven, but you might be living a worldly life. You might not be taking up your cross. John MacArthur, uh, Kirk Cameron, Ray Comfort, these guys, they don't go that far. They say this, is that basically if you are worldly, you don't take up the cross of Christ, that you're lost. Believe it or not, believe it or not, the third enemy is them. <laughs> yeah. That same verse that they think about, no, I'm taking up my cross for Jesus Christ. No, they're denying it. They're enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, you might go, really? So, Lordship salvation, believe it or not, is heresy. It's an, if you teach lordship salvation, you're an enemy of the cross of Christ. Amen. Now that's shocking, but I'm going to prove it to you. Why? What's the context? Galatians 6. Go back to Galatians 6. Go to Galatians 6. Let's look at context here. Don't get mad at me. Don't get mad at me. Let's look at Galatians chapter 6. A bunch of Calvinists now sucking on their thumbs, tearing off their hair, keep trolling me. It's a wonder they watch too many of my videos. I, they must be faithful attendees of my ministry than John MacArthur's. <laughs> then uh, James White. Then Apologia Studios and etc. So, so I, don't know what's a, I don't know what's the matter with these people. Alright, let's go to Galatians chapter 6. Let's go to Galatians chapter 6. We're going to look at verse 12. Remember that's the context? Yeah. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. So this is the enemies of the cross of Christ, which we established earlier with the Jews, right? But look at the verse. You're not paying attention. Look at the beginning of verse 12. The beginning of verse 12. As many as desire to make a fair, what? Show in the flesh. Wait a minute, what's that? Go to Galatians 2, or Galatians 3. Go to Galatians 3. Galatians chapter 3. Look at this one. Look at this one. Verse 1, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth. What? crucified among you. So there's a crucified life here. What is that? Salvation by grace through faith, not by works. Keep reading here. Keep reading. This only would I learn of you. Receive thee the Spirit by the what? Works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Well, no, no, no. I am saved by faith, but works perfect my faith. No, they didn't read verse 3. Read verse 3. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect? See that? By the what? Flesh, verse 5, verse 5. He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the what? Works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Verse 6, even as Abraham believed God, okay, no works to perfect that, he just believed and it was what? Accounted to him for righteousness. He's automatically considered to be righteous. Now, uh, this is even, uh, look at verse uh, 12. And the law is not of what? Faith. Now that's very clear. See, works are not faith. There's no such thing as works perfecting your faith. No, the Bible says the works of the law at verse 5 and verse 2, they're not faith. That's plain as day. So if, if what's this double tongue speech? Yes, says John MacArthur. Yes, says some of these Calvinists. We believe 
uh, solo fide, uh, faith only, faith alone. But it's a genuine faith that have works. No, that's a double tongue. That's why I kick these guys very hard because they contradict their own statements. Through what? Philosophical wordplay, theological semantics, they call it. That's not being honest. That's a, you know what the translation for that is? You're not being honest. That's the translation for that. I have zero respect for that. That's why, you know, uh, I rub dirt on the educated world. Why? Because all they use is semantics and their knowledge to hide their dishonesty. So I don't like that, period. So faith only means what it says. It's faith only. Okay? It's that simple. Don't say that it's a genuine real faith that have works. No, then that's not faith only. We saw Galatians 3. Works are not faith. Period. Period. They're separate. So John MacArthur, Kirk Cameron, Ray Comfort, they're an enemy of the cross of Christ. And every time, Ray, Ray, every time Ray Comfort preaches on the street and gives a Lordship Salvation Gospel, he does he not realize he's an enemy of the cross of Jesus Christ? That's strong. That's strong. Alright, let's go back to Philippians 3. Philippians 3. Philippians 3. Surprising, huh? Surprising right there. So when Paul talks about Philippians 3.18, this is inclusive of the Lordship Salvation people that teach that heresy. Alright, let's go to verse 19. So then the enemies of the cross of Christ, what's going to be their end? Verse 19, whose end is destruction. So their end is they're going to be destroyed. Whose God is their belly. Their God is their belly. So it shows... Uh, uh, I'll explain that part a little bit later. And whose glory is in their shame. So all the glory that they have and that they can own is their shame. That's what God's going to give to them. Who mind earthly things. Their mind is bottom line earthly. It's worldly. Yeah. I mean, even the Lordship Salvation people will talk about, you know, denying the world, take up your cross. No, they're very earthly, worldly minded. You might say, what's your evidence? The evidence is simple. I read their books. The language they use and the education system they turn to is of the world, not the Word of God. I read R.C. Sproul's book on philosophy and etc. He wants to revive the world's, uh, he wants to revive the world's view of philosophy. But he wants to put it in a biblical term, whatever that means. So, look, I believe in, if, love, if philosophy means a lover of human wisdom, I believe in using the wisdom uh, that we have for the Word of God. But it's so obvious from uh, Calvinist texts and their education, if they were to have one choice, the Bible or worldly education, they would go for worldly education. That's very apparent. If we come to the bottom line, you might say, why? Because some of the stuff that I teach from the Bible, from the Bible, they reinterpret that. And they say, no, that's a crazy doctrine, weird teaching. Why? If it's from the Bible, it's got to be true. Because it doesn't m line up with your mainstream scholars, who are, of course, safe Christians. And they graduated from seminaries. See that? So it shows right here that they do mind earthly things. So their God is their belly when it comes down to the bottom line. It comes down to the bottom line. Now, uh, we see right here that at verse 19, their end is destruction then. These people who followed the God is their belly. That phrase, God is their belly, which you want to know, is a reference to a lust, pleasing the flesh. Because uh, when your body uh, gets very hungry, what does it want? It has to eat food. Please, it's appetite. So God considers uh, people who are so into the flesh, they're so hooked and addicted as if that they want to fill up their belly with food. You ever seen these people who go through a buffet line and then they just douse themselves and it just kind of makes you sick? Especially when they commit the sin of gluttony. So that's what God sees it as, as something distasteful, disgusting. And he calls uh, that a fleshly uh, appearance. He calls that God is their belly. So their God is their belly. They just stuff themselves. Blah, 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 blah. What's it? What, is, what are they stuffing themselves? Hillsong. Blah, 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 blah. You know, Calvinist. Blah, 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 blah. John MacArthur stuff. Blah, 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 blah. That's what they're doing. That's uh, what God sees it and views it as. Now, I know I'm being sarcastic, but that is the truth. That's how God sees it as. He sees it as something disgusting to him. 
So uh, let's look at uh, 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Now when we look at 2 Peter chapter 2, Paul, it seems like that it's possible, so it may be too... Uh, if Paul was focusing on the Jews, which is number one that I pointed out, right? So if he's looking at the Jews here, then obviously these enemies of the cross of Christ would be lost, right? They would burn in hell. So it is possible that these people who have the God as their belly, that Paul is looking them as lost people. All right, so let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, second, excuse me, thank you. Second Peter chapter 2. And we'll look at verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now remember, Paul was pointing out at Philippians 3, it's mark them who are the enemies of the cross of Christ who teach wrong doctrine, right? We pointed that out in our previous Philippian study. So there's no doubt these are t people who teach wrong doctrine at verse 1. But God says right here that uh, they bring upon themselves swift destruction. That matches with Philippians 3, whose end is destruction. So God is going to destroy these people. But it sounds like here that these are lost people. Look at verse 3. And through covetousness, Shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you? So notice the language here matches with whose God is their belly, their loss. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their what? Damnation slumbereth not. So this seems like lost people. We're going to look at verse 18, 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. So notice that matches with Philippians 3, the wording. Uh, we're also going to look at verse 14, 14. Having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way, and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam. So that's a false preacher right there. False teacher by context. Uh, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. So notice that the language here matches well with Philippians chapter 3. Whose God is their belly, false teachers, false prophets, false preachers. So uh, I give uh, some of them, or even a good number of them, the benefit of the doubt. But don't be surprised if there's a good number of them that are lost, who might, pro who might promote these three areas. They might be lost. So let's go to Romans 16, Romans 16. If you teach wrong doctrine, your God is your belly. That's why we take right doctrine seriously. Why do you make a big deal about doctrine? Why can't you all get along? Because I don't want to be known as a pastor whose God is my belly. Now you could accuse me of being arrogant. You accuse me of uh, gra grabbing people for myself. But you know what? No, it's a matter, the truth is, I just don't want my God to be my belly. If my God was my belly, I feed myself with more subscribers, more likes, more good comments, and more money from you guys, and more people in my church, and more praise and adoration from uh, mega churches out there. See that? Some, some of you guys don't really un pay attention to Scripture. You go more by your feelings yeah. rather than the Word of God. Right. And if you go by feelings, I wonder who your God is then. Alright, go to Romans chapter 16. Go to Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the what? Doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their what? Own belly. And notice how this matches with 2 Peter 2. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. I know why I don't attract you people a lot and then you unsubscribe or you get mad at me. You know why? I don't give you fair speech. Yeah. It's a harsh, cruel, cruel, crude, rude speech. But Paul said that my speech is rude and contemptible. Yeah. That's what Paul said. No, you want me to talk like Johnny Boy, you know, like grace to you and talk to you in that language. 
But no, I refuse to do that when you look at verse uh, 18 there. I don't want to play semantics and use poetry language on you and then pretend that I'm so smart when I'm actually not and I don't know what I'm talking about. The Hebrew and the Greek word says, no, you don't know what you're talking about, buddy. You just cheated through Strong's Concordance and then pretended you're so smart. Uh, <laughs> they don't even know how to <laughs> go to Philippians chapter 3. Return to Philippians 3. So you notice why the church is falling apart? Because they, the people, listen up onliners, you love preachers like that. That's why the church falls apart. And Paul points out that's an enemy of the cross of Christ. You have to separate from that. You've got to emphasize more on right doctrine. Doctrine is so important. If you don't get right doctrine, how can you tell who's a right and wrong preacher then? You need to find out right doctrine. And how you find right doctrine is, look at the Word of God. Rather than getting upset at me, why don't you just open up your Bibles and look at the Bible. Those of you who get mad at me, sometimes I want to challenge you. I wonder if you're even looking at the verse or even studied the verse that I pointed out. You probably didn't. And that's why you're going by the flesh, lust of the flesh. God is your belly to judge whether I'm a spiritual pastor or not. How can you judge something spiritual by feelings of the flesh? Now, you can tell and judge something spiritual if you look at the Word of God. So open up that book and don't be lazy. Come on now, open up your Bible and look at the verse. Alright, now let's look at Philippians 3. Philippians chapter 3. So, these are people who mind earthly things that we found out at verse 19. That's why it's so important at verse 20, what do you do? For our conversation is in heaven. Alright, so then in verse 19, you're not supposed to be like those who are enemies of the cross of Christ. Because you cannot put your mind on the things of this world. Okay, so whose God is their belly? It's going to be right down here at the gutter where it belongs. So you don't want to be like that. This is all earthly things. You don't want to follow the ways of the earth or the world. You have to keep your eyes up, right? So you got to look at Jesus Christ. Looking, the church has to be looking at Jesus Christ. You have to keep looking at above where Jesus is. Now when you keep your eyes on Jesus Christ then your eyes are also set toward heaven. And then when you keep thinking about heaven, the rewards, the gold, silver, precious stones, the five crowns, and how much heaven is much better than our earth, then what happens is your affection on the earth diminishes and then your affection on heaven increases. And you could care less what things of the world you don't have. Why? Because you already set your affection, your mind on heavenly things, not on the earth. That's why I... Uh, tell you Christians this is that you've got to be careful. You can be this point number two here. You can, mind, you can be the enemy of the cross by uh, setting your affection on things of the world. You've got to watch out for that. You don't want to be an enemy of the cross. Now, let's look at Colossians. Colossians. And then I want you to go to Hebrews 12. Let's look at Colossians 3 and Hebrews 12. Colossians 3 and Hebrews 12. So let me repeat Philippians 3, 20, so that we can understand. For our conversation is in heaven. So the way we talk, a lot of things, you've got to realize what's in your heart is from out of your mouth. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Okay? So the way that you talk, you got to be careful, is it more of the worldly stuff or is it spiritual? That's why uh, you have to... Uh, it's not playing spiritualism or playing church that, oh, I go to church, I only can talk spiritually, I can't talk normal. No, that's not the point. The point is, is that if you do talk spiritual things out of your mouth, it shows where your heart lies in. See, so your heart lies so much on the things of heaven rather than on this earth. So... Uh, from your conversation, your mouth, it shows your affection in your heart as well. So where is it? On the earth or is it in heaven? If it's in heaven, then look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2. Colossians 3 and verse 2. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So notice right here, your affection has to be up in heaven and not on earth. So where is your affection lying in? If uh, it's down here, then you're an enemy. 
Notice, uh, if we go back to Philippians 3.20, the key is this. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so your conversation from whence, so out of that conversation that talks about heavenly things, it comes out from that conversation because you're looking at the Savior. When you keep looking at the Savior, when you keep looking at Jesus Christ, what happens is, is that your affections are, are set on things above. What's going on with the mic? Is it crackling again? Uh, no, it just went out out of nowhere. All right then, so... Uh, it did. All right. The ba battery is low, it says. All right, so can you uh, charge the battery, please? Okay. All right, make sure, gentlemen, that the batteries uh, get fully charged, okay? All right, then. All right, then. Thank you. All right, so then at Philippians chapter 3, notice that our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. When we're looking at our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, that's why our conversations on heavenly things, when we look at the Savior. Now, when we're looking at our Savior, that also means we're looking for His coming. Because look at verse 21. Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body? So that verse is no doubt talking about the rapture when our bodies get transformed. So returning to back to verse 20, the idea is this. When the church is looking at Jesus Christ, obviously we're anticipating for His coming. Now you might say, why would we look for the rapture? The simple answer is this. If your affection is in heaven rather than on the earth, what happens? What happens is, I want to get out of this earth. I want to go up to heaven with Jesus Christ. That's why Paul says that when we, our affection is on things in heaven, our conversation is in heaven, from out of it, we are looking at Jesus Christ when He raptures us. What he means by that is because uh, we have a disdain of this earth and we just want to be raptured. Get out of this wicked earth. And we want to be in heaven with, uh, we want to be up in heaven with Jesus Christ. So that's the whole bottom line. Now, if that's not the case, this is something very amazing. Look at Hebrews 12 then. Hebrews 12. This is something that I never thought of before, and it might be another thing to think about. If we look at verse 2, Hebrews 12.1, uh, 12.1. 12, 1, 12, 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now notice right here, when you're looking at Jesus, you're setting aside the sinful things. That matches with Philippians 3. When your affection is looking at Jesus Christ, then right here is where it's a big no-no then. See that? So you don't tend to go here. Okay? The sin that doth so easily beset us, you'd cast it away if you're really looking at Jesus. So I'll, uh, sometimes you have to ask yourself, when sin is dominating your life, when you're very worldly, are you truly uh, looking forward to heaven? Are you truly thinking about heaven? Or is your mind every day seeing the advertisement on the billboards, on the TV, in your cell phone, and then the world around you? That's why it makes sense. You're not happy. And that's the reason why also uh, you're struggling with a sinful problem or a worldly problem. Why? You're looking at it too much. You're not looking at heaven. It's that simple. So sometimes you have to ask yourself that. Am I really thinking about heaven? Am I setting my affection on things above? Am I uh, really concentrating only on that? Or am I looking too much at the world and I've got to learn to shut it off a bit? Maybe you need to shut it off a bit. Now, this is uh, something that I never thought of before. Is 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Now, if you look at Jesus Christ, the verse says, the verse points out, when you keep looking at Jesus Christ, at verse 20 and 21, you should be looking forward to the rapture. Now, this is extremely, extremely dangerous sin that you don't want to fall into. Here's the thing. The easiest crown to get, for some of you who don't know, is called the crown of righteousness. The crown of righteousness, how do I get that crown? Way easy. Way simple. 
uh, how you get this crown of uh, righteousness is simply you look forward to the rapture. Amen. You just look forward to Jesus coming. So you just want Jesus Christ to come back and take you home to heaven. It's that simple. Now, that should be the easiest crown to get. But let me tell you this. You'd be surprised how many Christians are not going to get this crown. And you might go, why is that? The simple answer, the reason why they're going to miss this crown, is they don't look forward to Jesus' coming. And you might say, what fool, what fool will not look forward to Jesus' coming? I'll tell you who the fool is. Those who look at the world too much. And they look at the world too much and they're like, no, Lord, and I can testify to this fact when I see my own loved ones around me. When they start to talk in language like, I want to get married first, or I want to get a job for us first, or I want to get money first, or I want to get some of this stuff first, that you give it a couple of years, they become as wicked as some kind of liberal atheist later on. And I'm talking about Bible-believing Christians. And I know that from personal experience. You might say, how do you end up like that? Because of this beginning stage here. This is the easiest crown to get. But you can lose that crown easily. Why? Because your affection is on the things of this earth. Philippians 3 warns you about that. Philippians 3 warns you that when your affection is on the things of this earth, then your affection is not looking forward to Jesus coming. And you can miss out that crown of righteousness. You know what's going to be sad? It's going to be sad that San Jose Bible Baptist Church is going to consist of people who aren't going to get that crown of righteousness. And God's going to call you out by name. And you can't hide it anymore. You can hide it in front of me and everybody else, but guess what? At the judgment seat of Christ, we're all going to see it. All right, look at 2 Timothy 4. Under conviction, verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. How do you get it? Which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that what? Love is appearing. So if you love the appearing of Jesus Christ, you easily get that crown. Amen. Now isn't it interesting what Paul said at verse 9 and 10, Right after he mentioned about, if you look forward to Jesus' coming, you get this crown. But there are people who won't. Verse 9. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this what? Present world. Isn't that coinky dinky right there? That Paul wrote that. Alright, go back to Philippians 3. Philippians 3. That's why you have to be very careful with that. A uh, conversation of yours and that heart. If it's filled up with so much of the world, it shows where your heart lies. And give it enough time, you'll miss out the easiest crown ever to get. Alright, let's go back to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 21. So then, this is obviously talking about when we look for Jesus Christ and not only looking at Him, but for His coming. When he comes at the rapture, what's he going to do at verse 21? Who shall change our vile body? So that's plain as day. Our body is vile. It's wicked. We can all say amen to that one. And God's going to change it, transform it. That it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. So God's going to make sure that he fashions that body. He's going to mold and transform and make that body where it's going to be like uh, Jesus Christ's own glorious body. So, Jesus Christ's body is glorious when He resurrected. According to the working, whereby... Uh, so, it's according to what, how God works. What's God's working? Whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. So, then, according to how God works, whereby, so where, from this, He is able to control, to make everything in creation, submit to Him. So it's according to that working, according to that power, His operation, how He's omnipotent, controls all of creation, that same working and power of His is going to be used to transform your body. That's the idea. Now, let's look at uh, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Now, Notice here that if we're going to become like Jesus Christ in His body, a lot of people uh, know about that, but they don't really understand what that uh, entails, actually. So, when you get raptured, uh, let me draw a line here, that way I can connect it down here. 
So when, you, when your wicked fleshly body gets transformed to the body of Jesus Christ, basically, which is what I believe in, I believe that you're exactly going to uh, look like Jesus Christ. And some of you might go, what? Really? That's so bizarre. But not when you look at the scriptures here. The scripture here uh, shows that, uh, let me know if the whiteboard's out of bound. I accidentally moved it, sorry. So uh, notice right here that in 1 John chapter 3, when we get our rapture here, we get the same body like Jesus Christ has. So look at 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3. And then we'll read uh, verse 2, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall, uh, he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So that verse points out that when Jesus Christ appears, when he comes down at the rapture, we're going to be like him. But this is something that you didn't notice here. Look at the wording here, okay? The wording here is verse, the beginning of verse 2. They don't read it carefully. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Okay, let's break that down. What does that mean? It, we don't know yet what we're going to be like in our appearance. Right. So it's explaining the appearance. What is our appearance going, what are we going to appear like? Look at this. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. So we're going to be like Jesus Christ when he appears. Right. So as Jesus Christ, when he appears, we're going to be like him. But this last part is more plain. For we shall see him as he what? As he is. So when that verse says, as Jesus Christ come down, as he is, how he literally appears and looks like over here, our appearance is going to be like that. So he's going to appear as he is. Why do you think John wrote it that way? Because he knows Acts chapter 1. Jesus Christ is going to come exactly like he is. So he's going to be physically himself. That's what the disciples, the Christians, uh, are looking forward to. Jesus Christ as He is. And we're going to be like Him. Now, obviously, this uh, brings up one of the disturbing things. Then you're saying that women are going to have a body sex change right here. So that becomes disturbing. Where uh, there's an infamous saying that basically that there are no female Christians in heaven, then that means. No, the idea is this. The idea is that male, both male and female, are going to be changed. Male is going to be changed too. If I come as I am, then that's a sinful, vile body. All of us are going to be changed. And the idea is not male or female. The idea is this, and this will humble you more. It's not a matter of, oh, I transformed to a different sex or gender. No, the idea is this. The idea is you're going to transform into no greater body or person in all of the universe. And we're not talking about a supermodel, and we're not talking about like a physically fit athletic guy. We're talking about the creator of the universe. Now when you think about that way, the heart, the heart humbles itself, and then you can't help but just well up in tears after that. There's no other, per no greater honor than to be like Jesus Christ. Amen. So when you have that in mind, then it becomes more understandable that our transformation in our body is going to be God Himself, Jesus Christ. Now think about this, is that no wonder Satan hates your guts. Is, uh, you know, that, that makes sense with a lot of devotional devotionals or even songs that we sing like I saw Jesus in you the only Jesus they'll ever see is you and why God lives in you so that you can reflect his light you can reflect Jesus Christ why is that because we are going to become like that and this is the closest you're going to be your cr current Christian walk is the closest in being like Jesus Christ that's why Paul mentioned about be followers of me as I follow Christ so don't take your Christian walk uh, lightly. Take it seriously. It's such a great honor and privilege Amen. because you're going to become like him one day. Amen. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. I pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, tonight's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers. Open our understanding and our hearts to the words of your book and made us grow more in grace and to be more uh, excited and privileged to the blessings you have in store for us and to take seriously right and wrong doctrine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.